What's up, Hope City? How are y'all doing today? Y'all feel good? No. Wow. None of you do. <laughs> Love that. You guys are like, are we supposed to feel good? I don't know. I know. Hi, my name is Megan. Nice to see you guys today. I'm glad y'all are here. Um, if you do not know me, I and my husband, Pastor Jono, uh, we are the campus pastors for our Shepherdsville location. Woo! Exciting. Launching in September. Um, August will be the beginning of our fourth month on staff here, and I just want to start by just saying thank you to you guys for really making this feel like family here at this church. Like, it's been incredible. You guys have been so hospitable and just awesome. You guys are so fun, and I love Hope City. Love getting to know every single one of you guys, so I just want to say thank you for welcoming us, um, for allowing me to speak to you today. We're going to have a good day. Sound good? Sounds good. Awesome. So... If you don't know, um, my husband and I have three kids, Lakin, Judah, and Silas, and they have been on vacation in Texas for three weeks. We have not had them for three weeks. They come back tomorrow. Super excited, y'all, because I miss them so bad. Really bad, okay? The first week they were gone, we were on cloud nine. It was wonderful. The house stayed clean. Like, my kids are little, too. Like, I, we have twins that are two, and my daughter is four. She's about to be five this month. So, I mean, they were like hurricanes and tornadoes ruining everything. The first week, everything was clean. The house was quiet. It was wonderful. We were like, this is amazing. We were eating ice cream every night for dinner without the kids eating it too. Like, so good. And then about the eighth or ninth day, you're kind of just like that quiet that was nice before turns really eerie. And you're like, I don't know what to do with myself. And we were sitting on the couch one night. And I looked over. I'm like, what, you, you want to play a board game or something? Like, I don't know. I don't know. So it's been, it's been difficult without them, but they're coming back tomorrow, you guys. So I'm very, very excited. Ooh, get my kids back. Excited. So somebody look at your neighbor and say, don't hate. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, turn to your other neighbor. Say it again. Don't hate. Appreciate. Y'all remember that? Don't hate. Appreciate. Love it. Good. Now that we've said that, we can be a little honest in the room today. I don't like to judge, so I want this to be a judgment-free zone in this place, okay, you guys? So how many of you would admit, show of hands, that you're a little bit weird? So, oh, great, good. Not just me. Fantastic. A little bit weird. Maybe do some weird things, okay? Just to name one, I have seen somebody do this in real life. Like maybe you let your dog eat out of your mouth. You ever see some? I have seen someone do that, this little chihuahua. This lady put, like, okay, she did that. It's a thing. I don't know why, but, yes, I've seen that. Or maybe, okay, you're a little weird. I get it. Maybe you shave your toes. Anybody do that? Oh, some honest people right here. Love that. Shave your toes. Kind of gross. I don't know. Do some odd things. You know, like things you don't really want brought up at, like, family reunions or Christmas, kind of like that, you know. You kind of do that. Or maybe you don't do weird things. Maybe you eat weird things. Like combinations are kind of weird a little bit. Taylor, like, like chocolate-covered bacon, or which kind of sounds good, but probably gross too. I don't know. Or I've seen somebody put cheese in their cereal. Like, I don't know why that's a thing. That's exactly how I feel. So I'm not that weird, okay? We're on the same page here. Like cheese in your cereal? I don't know. And then let's go ahead and settle this debate right now. Pineapple on your pizza? Just... No. Come on. No. All right, we need to divide the room to two halves right now. I'm just kidding. So I don't know why people do that. Pineapple. Ugh, I don't know. That's kind of weird. That's all right, though. So it is okay that you might be a little odd. We are kind of an odd family. My husband, it, he is oddly into these Netflix murder docuseries, like creepily into them. We'll like be talking about the trial that happened like eight years ago, like knowing every detail. I'm like, this has nothing to do with day-to-day -day life, but you are so into this right now. So, kind of weird. I'm kind of that way, too. Um, I don't know. I, I count my steps a lot. You guys do that? Like, in your head, probably a little too much. That's what, I don't know why. I often refer to myself in the third person and have, like, conversations with myself, pretending I'm talking to somebody, like my sibling or somebody, like, I'm mad at, like, at the time. And I totally win every conversation, <laughs> all the time. Okay. Judging by your laughter, I'm not the only one, so I... That makes me feel good. Makes me feel pretty good. And I have to admit that I treat my pets like equals. Okay, they're like humans to me. They're my babies. And I talk to them like they are my babies. 
So whenever you come over to our house and you see me talking to my puppies like this, don't judge me, okay, if I'm a little bit weird. Anybody else do that? It's just the four of us, all right. It's a small category. It's okay. Y'all are my friends. Okay. Today, I want to talk about your biggest hater, you. I want to talk about letting go of the judgment that we have for ourselves and how being free without the extra weight of guilt and shame allows us to live a better life with Jesus. So it's going to be good. This message is entitled Grace over guilt. So somebody say grace. 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 Amazing grace. Mm. I'm going to break out in song. Hallelujah. Just kidding. How many guys know that song, Amazing Grace? Yes. It is a classic. So I have to be honest, because we are a judgment-free zone in this place right now, like Planet Fitness, that, amen, that when I think of Amazing Grace and I think of that song, I always associate it with this memory that I'm going to share with you. It's a story kind of can't help it anymore. It's a little embarrassing, but I'll share it with you. Um, I was leading uh, worship at a church a few years back, and we decided to sing Amazing Grace during church. So I'm like, okay, cool, I got this. I mean, to be honest, I don't know how many verses are in the song, still to this day, probably like 22. I don't know. But when we rehearsed it for practice, we did a chorus, and I'm like, yeah, everything, you know, it's, it's the same melody. We'll get through it. So we had a short practice. I'm like, as long as I got words on the back screen, which usually there are for singers, I'll be good, you know. As long as that's good, we're fine. So we get to worship, and we get through, like, the first and second verse, and we're singing it again, and the screen goes black, like, completely blank. I don't know what happened. And I'm in there, like, Try not to make people see it on my face, but I'm like, we're going to get through this, Jesus. I don't know how. And I kid you not, I made up a verse. Just added. And I'm sure it rhymed. Like, I think it did. I don't know. I think it rhymed. And I, I don't even know what I said to this day, but the, that's not the funniest part. The funniest part is nobody knew. Nobody knew. Everyone's just still worshiping. They're like, this is amen. This is inspired of the Lord. This is good. And everyone just kept worshiping. So it was absolutely wonderful. Like nobody knew. But to this day, I always associate Amazing Grace with that. It's kind of embarrassing. But it's kind of how I think about Amazing Grace. It's okay. Well, my husband and I, we work for Pastor Jason. And that means that we cannot get on this stage without defining you some kind of word, which is fair. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and define grace for you. Uh, Webster's has three different definitions for it, okay? The first is elegance, okay? So that's kind of like she is graceful, he is graceful, or not in some cases. Just like me. The second is a prayer stated over dinner. So like you say grace before you bless a meal. So we're saying grace, okay? And the last is kind of closer to what I want to talk about today, and it is the unmerited kindness and favor of God. The unmerited kindness and favor of God. But what does that mean to me? And what does that mean to you, like, practically in our lives day to day? Like, grace, all right, what does it mean to us? So let's open up our Bibles to kind of find out a little bit. So if you've got yours with you, you can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And I'm going to read this. So Luke was written by, man, y'all are Five stars over here. Perfect. Y'all are like, I got this. It's going to be easy. This is easy to follow. Luke was written by Luke. Perfect. And just a little context while you guys are turning there. Jesus was talking to his disciples here, and he's talking to them about recovering the lost and befriending people that nobody really wanted to be friends with, if you're honest. He's telling them three stories about how and why he loves them and just how far God would go to recover them. So three stories, and we're picking up on the last and most popular story called the prodigal son. And don't let that word scare you if you don't know what it means. Prodigal just simply means wasteful. So the wasteful son. So let's read it together. Chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons, The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Such a kind son. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, 
This younger son packed all his belongings and he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and they began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So I'm going to stop right there. Right about now, he's at a low point, okay, super low. He ain't got no friends. He ain't got no money for rent. No one is answering any of his phone calls. No one's feeding him. Like, that, that's low. Like, even I have a friend that I could call, and they'd be like, yeah, I'll give you some of my food or whatever. He had nobody at this point. So it's pretty bad. And have you guys ever seen a pig, like, in real life? Not on, like, TV? Have you ever pet a pig? It's disgusting. Like, they're... <laughs> It's not, nobody downplays that word because it, like, filthy as a pig, because I think my kids are filthy, but no. Pigs are bad, and they stink. They absolutely stink. That's, that doesn't have anything to do with that. Okay. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And for me, this kind of resonates as being like 18, and you think you know everything, and you move out because you think you're going to be an adult, but you really can't even afford ramen noodles. And then you move back into your parents' basement kind of thing because adulting is hard. Okay? That's how it resonates. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Y'all didn't know they had fiestas in the Bible, did you? I don't know. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard the music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother's back, he was told, and your father's killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry. It wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. I love that. I absolutely love that. I love this story because it is all about the love of a father, the unconditional love of a father. In essence, it's explaining how it's like when you or I raise our hand to commit our lives to Christ for the first time. God rejoices in that moment. He's happy about it. Or maybe that you've, you've gone and done some things and you're coming back to him. He rejoices. He's happy in that moment. He considers us found. But the grace of God is hard for most people to embrace. I kind of imagine it like hugging somebody who doesn't really receive hugs well. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You try to hug them, put your arms around them, and it's kind of like hugging a mannequin. They're just like super stiff, and it's awkward for you, it's awkward for them, you kind of just wish you never touched them at all kind of thing. <laughs> it's kind of how I see this embrace. And it's hard because we like to live our lives looking in the mirror and really picking ourselves apart, saying things like, I've just done way too much. Like, I don't deserve this. You don't understand, you don't know what my life's been like. Like, I've made some big mistakes. I've kind of messed things up. I'm too far gone. I don't really know who I am or what I want out of life. I don't deserve to be loved by God or anybody for that matter. 
we take the person we are today and compare him to others who are doing better. Or maybe somebody by their actions showed us that we're not worth their time, and then deep down we believe them. So the first thing I want you to know today is that God chose you and he's happy about his choice. God chose you and he's happy about it. Somebody say, God chose me. God chose That's right, yes, he did. <laughs> so I've, I've chosen some friendships, uh, I'm not going to lie, that I regret, okay? Probably, I'd say you have too, maybe sometime in your life. And you know how you can really tell if you really love somebody? When they call you and you see their name on your caller ID and you actually want to pick up the phone and answer it? Yeah? Do you ever have that person that when they call and you see that they're calling you, like, you do this thing like, ugh. Like, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, you know it's about to be an hour-long conversation that's just painful. So you're like, oh, i got to pick it up anyway kind of thing. That's how you know. But I, I never regretted following Jesus. Never. You want to know why? Because when nobody else was on my team, he was. When, when nobody else backed me up and I didn't even back me up, he did. See, I might not see the result I want when I look in the mirror right now, but I know in my mind that God is not done working on me and I'm not done working on me. We all desire the same thing. We all want a happy and a wholesome life, but deep down we may have done some things or made some decisions that we're just not proud of. Seriously. We keep them in our relationships and they become the center of our guilt and the center of our shame. And we're stressed because it's a full-time job covering that up. It is. What I've learned is that the mind replays what the heart can't delete. A simple moment can leave us a lifetime of shame. And we're hard on ourselves. We are seriously our biggest haters, picking ourselves apart day by day, saying, like, we're not good enough. We're not. And in this story, we have a son who found himself at a low point, but even though he had messed up, it didn't change who he was. I really want us to grab that today. God chose you because he knows your worth even when you don't. And just because you've had a hard time believing it doesn't mean it's not true. So the second thing I want you to know today is that God's not rating you. He's not. How many of you guys have Amazon Prime? Four of you that enjoy that. How many of you have ever bought anything on Amazon before? Okay, or, okay, cool. And how many of you guys have ever left a review on Amazon? Five, one out of five stars, yes, okay. Kind of getting to it. Yeah, or maybe you've taken a survey, you know, before and you've kind of left some reviews about your experience or, or you rated something. Or maybe you're like me and you'll only buy something if it has a review. That's how I am. That's the, exactly how I am. So I'll be honest, though. When I leave reviews or ratings, I like to be completely honest. Like, if it arrived and it's, like, the wrong color or it was broken, I'm like, piece of crap, one star. Just, I need my money back. Okay? I, that's how I am all the time. And people want to say that they're reasonable with their reviews on Amazon, but honestly, they're just funny. Like, that's probably my favorite part about going on Amazon now is to read the reviews people leave for things because they kind of take advantage of it, and they're really sarcastic, and it cracks me up. I love it. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some reviews that I have found on Amazon that completely tore me up. Like, I love them. So we're just going to do that, a little lighthearted today, okay? So what we're going to do, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen, and then I'm going to redo the review for it, okay? And if you like irony and, like, sarcasm, you're, you're going to love these. They're really, they're really good. So I, I love them. So we'll go ahead and put that first picture up on the screen for me. That's exactly what I thought when I saw it for the first time. <laughs> it's, an, it's a pocket knife uh, on steroids, kind of. I don't know who would ever use this thing, but I think that's what makes it hilarious to me. So I'll read you the review for it. Okay, this is a product that you can actually buy, believe it or not. You can buy all these things that I'm going to show you on Amazon, which is crazy. So they give you three stars, okay? Receive this pocket knife as a gift for my 18th birthday. Wish I'd have known what it was, because as soon as I touched it, I grew a mustache, 
took a motor apart and became a Navy SEAL. <laughs> my mom fainted and my dad laughed and gave me a fist pump. Best gift ever. <laughs> so true. I love it. All right, go ahead and throw that second one up there. So this is a mask, okay? It's, it's really, I've actually seen people wear these in real life. It's funny. Okay, so here's the review for it. Five stars. It is day 87, and the horses have accepted me as one of their own. I have grown to understand and respect their gentle ways. Now I question everything I thought I once knew and fear I'm no longer capable of humanistic society. Goodbye, public school. Goodbye, PlayStation. The mountains are calling. Signed, Winnie. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. All right, throw that next one up there. Did y'all know you can buy milk on Amazon? <laughs> I didn't know that at all, but I, I can't believe it. It is milk, okay? This is, I love this. This is probably a review that I would have written, something like I was said, okay? Five stars. Has anyone else tried pouring this stuff over dried cereal? Amazing. <laughs> I like that one. That's probably something I would have written. All right. I'll do one more for the last one. I still can't look at it without wanting to cry. It says, crafting with cat hair, cute handicrafts to make with your cat. I didn't know it was a real book. Oh, gosh. Okay, five stars. Oh, gosh. I can't get through it. <laughs> Who would have this book? All right. Excellent book. My wife and I had no idea how we'd buy Christmas gifts for our whole family this year. <laughs> Everyone was thrilled with their homemade earmuffs and mittens, and I have even found a new way to bond with our 10 cats, which is a constant struggle of mine. Thanks, Amazon. I love it. It's awesome. All right, let's give a hand for Amazon. I love them. Gosh. Oh, a cat book. Golly, I love it. But, you know, I think we do this a lot. I think we naturally rate things everywhere we go all the time. Like, we'll go into, like, a sketchy part of town or, or something, and, and we won't want to do it. Or we'll, we'll, we'll put in, you know, an address in our GPS for a new restaurant, and Siri gets you there because, let's be honest, she didn't get you there yourself. And you go down there, and it's sketchy, so you're like, whoop, you whip a 180 real quick. You're like, we're getting Taco Bell tonight. Not doing that. Or we rate people by what they look or, you know, whatever they're wearing today. It's kind of hard. Or we stalk people on social media, and then we compare our background to their highlights all the time. I think it's kind of become an addiction to us sometimes. Like, my pictures are way cuter than hers, so I'm good. Like, I feel good about myself kind of thing. And some of us, like, we just judge hardcore, like, even about church, I think. Like, some of us come in, and they're like, this isn't what church is supposed to be like, you know? Or what are they wearing? Why are they wearing that? I don't understand. Or Pastor Jason's not speaking again? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but you know, I think I know where that all comes from. And it's the mind replays with the heart can't delete. So let me just rate this thing before it rates me, you know. That we don't feel good enough, or we don't feel smart enough, or we're not wealthy enough, or whatever the insecurity might be, and then we project it on, on other things. So if I went around the room today and I asked each of you to give yourself a review or a rating, what do you think you'd say? Maybe something like, tries hard but often misses the mark, or had more potential 15 years ago, or maybe bites off more than she can chew, or has ambition but no direction, what kind of review would you give yourself? See, after the younger son has returned home from his past or whatever he had done, his father embraces him and he smothers him with kisses and, and, and he loves him and this is great and this filthy, lonely boy just wants to melt in his father's arms. But I could see if that was me, a thought coming over my mind, like, I don't deserve this. I, I, I really don't deserve to be loved right now. And then we kind of wiggle out of the embrace of grace. We kind of just push it aside like, it's not for me right now. 
I've just done way too much. Like, you don't understand. You don't know what my past has been like. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know where I've woken up, like, not even remembering where I was the entire night before. There's an awesome quote that I want to read you. It's by Judah Smith, who is a pastor, and he wrote the book Jesus Is, and it's a great read, and if you like to read, I definitely recommend that book. But it says this. It says, I believe most people have inadequacy and failure deep within themselves. No matter how hard they try or what they accomplish, they know they've sinned and they feel unworthy of God's grace. This can be a constant spiritual struggle that downplays what Jesus did for us. And it does. We compare, we rate, and we review ourselves, and we constantly give ourselves one star or no stars at all compare, rate, and review. See, it's almost like we make ourselves feel better for the sin in our lives when we compare it to other people's sin, like the older son did in the story. He's like, he spent his inheritance on prostitutes and like gambling or, or whatever he did, and he gets blessed? Like, what about me? I've been here and I've been great. Where's all the things that I deserve? Or I told a white lie, but I didn't murder anybody. It wasn't that bad. And then we develop a group of Christians believing somehow that after we receive God's grace, that we have to work to keep it. And we think we'll run faster and we'll work harder and we'll read more every day and we'll serve more in the church and we'll give more tithe. And then we'll prove to God that we're good and we'll get his attention. As if doing all that stuff got God's attention. That's why you have so many people serving God for years out of guilt and not love. So I asked a friend of mine in preparation for today what he thought grace was, and he gave me an analogy that I kind of want to share with you. He said, grace is like you're in a boat, and there's a current, and it's pulling you towards hell, and that's your life. And, and God gives you grace as a gift, and those are the oars. And as long as you keep rowing, you've got divine enablement to make it through life. And here you are, and this is grace. And God gave it to you. And I thought, okay, divine enablement. Well, that would mean that it's not amazing grace. It's amazing you. Like, this is me rowing. This is me serving. This is me giving. And it has nothing to do with how amazing God's grace is because it's all up to me. It's not amazing grace. It's amazing you. And you're not that great. <laughs> Not that amazing. God is the one who's amazing. His grace is. I want to read one more scripture for you guys. I'm almost done. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's not your rowing that allows you to experience grace or salvation. It's a gift, a free gift, not a reward. So don't beat yourself up about how I'll never be as good as so-and-so. I'll never be as talented or I'll never be able to give as much as this or they're qualified, I'm not. No acts of faithfulness impress Jesus. They don't. His grace is a free gift that covers a multitude of sins. And it's in, in that realization that we become free from our guilt and free from our shame. This gift is given so none of us can brag about it. Which, for some of us, if we do make it to heaven, that won't even really be a problem because you'd be like, I had nothing to do with getting here at all. So the last thing I want you to know today is that God is anticipating your return. He's anticipating your call. He wants you back. In the prodigal son story, verse 20 says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. So if you've ever, ever ordered a package before, you know exactly what that means. <laughs> The anticipation of your gift, 
Like, that's almost way too hard to handle sometimes. Like, you are constantly trying to figure out where it is, right? Like, I'll go online or go on my phone. Like, you're tracking it. Like, you need to know, like, when this package is going to be here. You even take off work so you could be at home just so, like, I need my package to arrive on time. Or, like, sitting by the window waiting for the truck, you know. And then when it pulls up, you don't even wait for him to come to you. You just run out to him. You're so happy. This is a complete stranger. And then if you're like me, you don't even open it inside. You open it right there in front of him. But it's because you care about what's in it. You want to make sure that it's not damaged. You want to make sure that it got there safe because you care about what's coming to you. What's arriving is special. Jesus is waiting for you today. He cares if you arrived him safe. He cares about you. He cares about the time it takes. He's anticipating your return. He's waiting on the hill like the Father, and he sees you, and he's waiting for you to come back. He's waiting for you to say, I know I messed up, but I'm coming anyway. I'm coming back to you because I know you love me. Don't wait. Don't let guilt get in the way of God's amazing, unmerited grace because no matter what your story is, no matter what your background's like or where you came from, God still wants you. He still chose you. Your past doesn't change that fact. God still loves you regardless. And the mind replays what the heart can't delete. So don't replay your past. Don't replay your shame. Let God embrace you and take it all in and forgive you. Let's pray.